Okay, let's test the sound. One, two, three, test. One, two, three, test. Uh, oh, not too bad. A bit bad. Well, it's Rotterdam, right? Um, I don't think many people like Rotterdam. Uh, there's no Altstadt, um, which is a shame, so... Sounds okay. Yeah, well, it wasn't too bad. Um, but uh, it was a big conference. There were a lot of fun talks, but there was also a lot of, like, not too interesting talks. So, um, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. But uh, it was okay. It was okay. I, I, I enjoyed myself. And I'm a little bit bugged that I missed the uh, dinner at Blydorp Zoo. Alright, sound is okay. Perfect. Yeah, I thought we'd just start with some music. Um, I'm still setting up. Um, I actually did something new. Like, I, I have a second perspective now. Like, <laughs> I, I added an additional perspective to the, uh, to the standard, like this one. So... Uh. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, like so that you guys can see what I'm seeing, right? Because like for you guys, you only see the, the standard thing, but you never see me like typing or my drawing board and, and these kinds of things and kind of the equipment that I have set up um, so that it works. But uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. We're up to two concurrent viewers. So of course, Misha's here. Misha's always here, uh, which is good. Um, I really appreciate that, Misha, that you're always here. Um, Alright, so... That's my email. That's another email. So YouTube mentions that I'm live. I don't know why I get actually notifications about that. Alright, let me move some windows around so that I am actually able to do stuff. This is for when we want to look at stuff. All right, so I'm just going to go to the lecture layout and it's going to be like this. Like, I don't know, like at least you now can see the stuff that I'm using. Um, and uh, since it's the last time that I'm streaming, probably in a long time, um, I'm not as prepared as I should be. But, uh, but today it's just you, Misha. I, uh, when I look at my YouTube thing, uh, I can see that it's one concurrent viewer. I don't even think that my moderator's here yet, um, which is logical. And the fun thing is, is actually my office is clean, cleaner than it has been in years because I, I spend all morning like cleaning up, tidying up and stuff. So I see two. How do you mean you see two? You see two what? Oh, two viewers. Yeah, that's true. So my moderator might be here. I hope so. I hope so. But uh, I don't expect too many students to show up um, because it's been a very, very busy week. Two viewers. Yeah, I, I just saw that. But yeah, at least like I, I, I took my phone, right? And I've added it as an additional camera. So then you guys can see what I'm, I'm seeing. Right, so you can like see the YouTube chat and when people say things and stuff. And besides that, you can see how it looks for me. So this is my OBS window where um, there's like the layout and I have all of the little buttons. And of course, I have my my stream deck here, so um, I can play music and switch scenes and stuff. Right, if I just press the Notepad plus plus button like this one here, then you can see that it's changing that. So and I thought it would be good to show you guys how it works when you're streaming and that it's more difficult than it looks like. You really need like two monitors. So I'm just going to put this one back. And of course you need the influencer circle, right? Like that's very important because otherwise like lighting will be very bad, especially since I've like lighting from the side. Cool toy, cool toy. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool toy to, to play with. Um, but let's just quit the music for now because it's really loud in my ears. I know it's not that loud for you guys. Um, but today, welcome, welcome everyone. This is going to be my final lecture for the HAU. So from tomorrow I will still be in at the university and I think I already told you guys this in a previous lecture. 
Um, I got a new job, so I will be moving to Northumbria University. So, um, let me see, show. Um, yeah, so um, I will be moving to Northumbria University, and the nice thing is that, um, well, the nice thing is, the sad thing is, is that I, I, I'm leaving here. Um, so I checked actually the Agnes thing, because some people had problems signing up for the exam. Um, that should be fixed now. So I hope that everyone is able to register for the exam. If you are not, of course, then send me a message. Um, but for today, I will just have a 25, 30, 40 minute presentation about creating an R package. Um, it's not, not as good as I want it to be, actually. Like, you can see the glare on the screen, which is a little bit annoying, but... Um, and it's too high up as well. It's just... Eh, let's do it like this. Let's hope that it doesn't just drop. Good. Um... It's really interesting. Like I could have like five, six cameras if I wanted to, but uh. so yeah, we will be talking about the R package and then I will give you guys an overview. And then at the end of the overview, I will show you guys a couple of exam questions from last year. Um, so we can, or so you guys can get a feeling of what kind of questions I'm asking for the exam. Um, so with that all out of the way, Let's start my final lecture for the Humboldt University. Um, so, like I said, we are going to create an R package called not another R package, right? Because we've been programming in R and we've been generating a lot of scripts, um, but we want to, of course, have other people use our code. So how to do that? Well, that's by creating an R package. Um, so during this whole presentation, I will be creating an R package, which has the annoying name, your package name. And originally when I made this lecture, I thought it would be a really good idea to call it your package name. But after doing this lecture for like a couple of years, I actually figured out that it's, that it's a lot harder um, than it looks to say your package name every time. But uh, we're just gonna create a package. Um, if you looked at the lecture from like last year, um, there's a R package in 15 minutes. Um, so that just contains R code. But I wanted to show you guys as well how it works when um, you have C or C++ code that you want to put behind R, right? Because R is a very, um, versatile language and you can actually use it to call um, C or C++ um, and it has as an added advantage is that you can use uh, things like pointers and use very optimized code um, because R itself is not that optimized for very big data sets and the nice thing is of course is that by using C or C++ you can actually do that um, and create a really really advanced uh, R package where you have like really good code behind it. So first things first, if you want to create an R package, you need to have the R compiler. So the R compiler is called R tools and you can get it from the link on the screen. So HTTPS or HTTP, this is still the old link. Um, Cron, if you are on Windows, then it's bin Windows R tools. If you're on Linux, it's something like bin Linux R tools. And if you're on Mac OS X, it's something like OS X R tools. Um, but the thing that you have to be aware of is that the um, R tools version that you are installing should match your version of R. Um, and when I made this slide, the latest version was R 3.2.5, I think. Um, but currently we are at R 4.01 or 4.02, I think. So again, um, this is very important because if you install the wrong version, um, it will not be able to build packages that you can install. And of course, if you want to build help files and these kinds of things, you might need MicTex. Um, so MicTex is a LaTeX compiler. Um, so LaTeX is a layout language, which is used a lot in computer science and mathematics. Um, but um, um, it, 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 it's not required to build the package um, but if you want to build the package and look at the uh, look at the help files that it generates um, then you need to install MicTex as well so you can get it from here it's a big install um, so if you install the full MicTex comp uh, 
LaTeX compiler suite, um, it will cost you like 1.6, 1.7 um, gigabytes of your hard drive. Good, so after you've installed these things, then you can start building an R package. Um, so an R package is all about structure. And here we see the official guidelines. Let me just click on it. Um, then it opens up in the wrong window. So I'm going to open it up in the correct window. Um, so if we look at Firefox, right, then this is the manual for writing R extensions, right? So this is for version 4.2, the latest version. And if you go down, you can see that it's a massive, massive document, which has like eight chapters. Um, and it's really, really long, right? So it just goes into all the nitty gritty details. And you have to know all of these details because that's, that's important because every little rule that is specified in this document, um, you have to follow. And it's really a lot. So if you would print it, it would cost you around like 60, 70 pages. Um, and it's a lot. And it's, it, it, no one wants to read this document. So that's why I made the lecture, because instead of reading this 60 page document, um, you can more or less just follow this guide and build an R package, which they will accept on Chrome. Um, so that's always the goal, right? Is get your code bundled up in a package and then put it on Chrome so that people can just do install packages um, and then give the name of your package and then use it in their own code. Good. So, um, Insta if, if, of course, you get stuck somewhere, then do consult the official guidelines. So that's why the link is here. So you can just use the link to go to the official guidelines. Um, and the first things first, so you need to create a folder, right? So I always create a folder on my desktop when I make a new package, um, just because it's a good place to put everything. Um, but everything in there needs to match the official guidelines. So that is the important part. Besides that, when you want to build an R package, you have to start using the command line. So in Windows, the command line is just pressing the Windows key um, and then um, starting CMD, right? So cmd.exe is the, is the Windows command line executable. Um, and it opens up this kind of a screen, which looks a li little bit like MS-DOS, um, which allows you to just directly type commands which are executed in, in, in Windows um, or against the Windows subsystem. Um, so hey, because we need to execute in the command line, I want to make sure that people know how to start it. Um, so it's very easy. You just press the Windows key. Uh, just basic CMD or run as admin, just basic CMD. Um, because like we don't need any administrative privileges unless you, of course, want to install your package somewhere where you don't have full rights. But normally, if you install R as a user, then you can also install packages as a user. So you don't have to have administrator privileges. So just open up the command line and then it looks kind of like this, depending on which version of, of Windows you're using. I think this is still a screenshot from when I was still using Windows 7 or Windows 8. I'm on Windows 10 now, so it looks a little bit different, but it, it's very similar to this. Um, but of course, this is very advanced because like a lot of people never ever get to use um, the Windows command line. Um, but you, you will have to if you want to create an R package. Good. So, of course, we need to go to the desktop, right? So if you start it, then it will go to your user folder. So in this case, um, I was called user2 on the, on the computer. So I didn't use my own name. Um, I got my username being user2. Um, but so it's in C, which is the C drive. Um, then you say users, which is where all of the user accounts are stored, and then user2. Um, but because we are creating this package on our desktop, we have to move into the folder. So moving into a folder is done by the CD command, which is changing your directory. So what I'm saying is just CD uh, desktop and I created an empty, uh, empty folder, right? So the empty folder that I created is called your package name, right? Because that's going to be the name of my package. So if everything goes well, right, you are able to install the RTools compiler, you are able to install MicTex, um, you've created this folder on your desktop called your package name, um, then when you CD into the desktop folder, um, you can type RCMD with capitals 
check in small letters and then the name of your package so in our case your package name and since it's an empty folder um, it will tell you this right so it will if you would execute the command so I'm in C users user 2 I go to the desktop and then I execute the command rcmd check your package name so it will say that okay I'm going to use this folder here as my log directory um, this is the version of R that we're using this is the version of the compiler or of the platform so we're on Windows 64 bit um, I'm using this character set which might be a little bit different if you're from a different country um, and then it says checking for file your package name slash description and then it says no right because it's just an empty folder so there is no description file right and that is that is key in building an R package I can't repeat this enough building an R package is only about structure it has to be structured exactly the way that R expects things to be so R expects a certain file and folder structure so let's create this description file that it needs so we need to create an empty file and we need to call this file description all capitals uh, all caps so and all capital letters but we have to make sure that there is no .txt at the end right so uh, it sometimes happens that people use Windows um, and they save a file and it's called description.txt um, and then you have to just delete the extension of the file because this file is not allowed to have an extension so inside this file you can open it up using notepad plus plus for example um, you can just type the following so you can say package double point your package name um, you have to specify a version so in this case it's version 0.0.0 minus .0 .0 one first version of the package um, the date that it currently is or the date at which you are creating your package um, so you can see that when I first did this presentation it was the 9th of June 2015 so that's more than seven years ago when I did the presentation first you have to give it a title which is very important because the title is seen by people so make your title descriptive right so if you're making a package for genome-wide association then have at least genome-wide association in the title um, because it is the thing that people can use to search for um, if you're creating a package for ecology make sure that the title contains the word ecology if you're creating a package for the analysis of RNA sec data make sure that it's in there because these are the keywords for Google um, that that is used by um, Cron to kind of advertise your package you have to specify an author and a maintainer um, so you write down the name of the author and then you add between the larger than and smaller than uh, brackets uh, you add the email address which is very important um, because when you submit your package this is the email address so the email address of the maintainer will be used um, to contact you to tell you about any issues that they found with your package and things that go wrong you have to have a depends so in our case we're just going to make a package and the only thing that this package requires is of course R so that's what it says here it depends on R and in this case our package is going to be suitable for R versions greater than or equal to 3.0.0 so this is this is the thing that determines if R will install your package so if your package is very specific to a specific version of R you can specify a single version um, if every version of R from a certain version works then you can use this larger than or equal to um, the description gives a one line description of your package um, so in this case it's just my first R package again the description is important because it helps people find your package um, and then you have to specify a license and this is relatively tricky um, and I'm not a copyright lawyer either um, but you have to specify an open source license if you want your package to be distributed on CRAN they only have a very limited amount of, um, of, of licenses which are allowed so it has to be GPL3 or GPL2 um, you can go with I think MIT license um, there's the B, BSD license and there's a couple of other open source licenses which are allowed um, but you cannot use a closed source license right because you are distributing your code to other people um, the 
the code is given to people so you cannot keep the code closed um, so um, for a list of licenses go to the um, R extension manual they have a list of licenses and if you want to know more about licenses then I would go and um, tell you guys to go to the uh, EFF right so the EFF website um, they have a very good overview of which uh, licenses um, are there and which licenses allow you to do certain things right because you still with an open source license it could still be that you don't want people to use it for commercial purposes or to sell your package right so you can have limits um, on what is allowed um, using uh, an open source license good so now we have added this description file right so now we can again do the same thing so we open up the window uh, for commands so the the windows command line we go into the desktop folder and then we say rcmd check your package name right so just check again is it now a valid r package so um, what you can see here is that it's checking a whole bunch of things like it now finds the description file right it says okay there is a description file um, and then it's going to check a whole bunch of of different things um, and it's actually a valid package at this point, right? Because there's only a single note at the end um, saying that, well, there's something not entirely wrong, uh, not entirely correct with your package, but the package as such is a valid R package. So the most minimal R package contains no R code. It is just a single folder with a description file specifying what will be in the package um, but you have a note right so the note says packages without R code can be installed without a namespace file but it is cleaner to add an empty one AB thank you very much for the live stream sorry won't be able to catch up now we'll see the recording later please don't stop these videos I yeah we'll probably continue making videos in my free time um, but like I said I, I will be moving my job um, and I don't know for sure if I can continue live streaming my lectures um, from Northumbria University. Um, it's something that I still have to discuss with them there. Um, but if I'm not allowed to, then I will continue making videos like this, um, just not in work time, but in my free time, because I like doing it a lot as well. Um, so thank you for, uh, for the comment. Good, so packages are very easy it's just a folder with a description file but it mentions that if there's no R code it's perfectly fine you can install it however it is cleaner to add a namespace file right so what is this namespace file well this namespace file is there for you to load dynamic libraries so dynamic libraries under Windows are called DLL files, right? So you have, for example, an OpenGL.dll, um, but you also have other DLLs. So DLLs or dynamic link libraries or dynamic libraries are um, more or less compiled code which you can use. So it is code which is, for example, written in C or C++ or Fortran or some other language um, which can be compiled into this one of these dynamic libraries so they, they they contain code to do all kinds of things um, and there's literally like millions of DLLs available um, and these dynamic libraries are there to do things like um, creating a window using OpenGL using Vulkan for 3d display um, but there's a lot of other things that are in there, right? There's, for example, Bullet, um, which is an open source um, system for physics. Um, so you can do all kinds of physics simulations. Um, and you can then directly from R call these functions, which are made available by other people in these dynamic link libraries. So not just that, right? So it is there to load external libraries, um, but it also has a list of all the functions that are available to the user, right? So in this case, we, we have an empty package without any functions that we are giving to the user, um, but um, we, we do want to provide our code in our package, right? So that's why I'm going to create an empty file called namespace. Um, again, it's all caps. Um, there is no 
extension for this file so node.txt at the end and inside the file I'm going to add the following right so I'm going to say what does my package do well my package exports a single function to the user and the function name of this function so that when people start R load my library then this this function will be available to them to call right and this is in this case I am naming my function my first package function I could have named it anything right because when we write code I could have for example have a function called MSA to do multiple sequence alignment I could have a function called um, square root where I compute the square root of something um, but in this case as an example we're just going to make a function which is called my first package function good so of course I now need to make this function right so if I look in my Windows Explorer I have my uh, description file I have my namespace file um, but of course I also need to have a folder which are is which will contain our code because I promised in the namespace file that I would provide at least one function to the user right so I have to create a folder called R with a capital and this will hold all of the R code files so all the code in these files needs to be in functions so you are not allowed to have a script which starts with a set working directory you can have a script but this script can only contain functions because that is the only thing that you can give to users right because it's not like an R file or an R script that you would normally write it is a it is a, a package so a package contains functions and my strategy is always to have one file with one function in there and this is just so that I can easily find where a certain function is located so if I have in this case a function which I am promising to make my first package function what I will do is create an R code file the R code file is called my first package function dot R and within this file of course I add a header because that's just common sense to add a header so that people know when it was created by whom it was created uh, when it was written when it was last modified um, and in this case there is a single function in here called my first package function which is a function which takes no parameters and it doesn't do anything right because why would it do anything because it's just a and then I save it in this R folder Good. So now we have a namespace file which promises to produce this function. We have an R file which has the function and we have a description file describing how the package looks like. Right. So of course the next step is to check the package. Right. So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to do R CMD check your package name um, and it will do all kinds of checks. Um, and it comes now up with a warning so we first had a note so a note is not that serious but a warning is something that you need to fix your package is not allowed to have any warnings or notes when you submit it to cron right so now something is um, weird right so what is the warning is it, it warns you that it found an undocumented code object called my first package function so it mentions that all user level objects in a package should have documentation entries and this is key to why R is such a nice system to work with because every function in a package needs to be documented so R forces you to document your code and to write at least a minimal skeletal structure about what your code does what the input parameters are what is the expected output and an example and this makes a world of difference because a lot of um, other programming languages they don't force you to document your code if I submit code to for example the NPM registry for JavaScript there is no requirement to document anything um, I could just get away with saying um, this package does something right and then no one would know what it does but in R every function that you write needs to have a documentation object and this is this is core to how R works and makes it very beginner friendly 
So create we need to store our documents a uh, documentation somewhere. Right? So documentation goes into a folder called MAN for manual. And this is for some reason written with small letters. I don't know exactly why, but it's a choice that they made. So our code goes into a folder called R with capital letters. Manual files go into a folder called MAN, which has small letters. And again, I follow the same structure. One documentation file for one function, right? So inside my MAN folder, I create a new file called my first package function dot RD. Right, so the R is saying that, oh, it's an R file and the D means documentation, right? So the extension .R means there's code in here and .RD means that this is a R documentation file. So this is what I now have inside of the my first uh, my R package. And it is, okay, so I have a manual, I have, uh, I have manual files in this folder. I have an R folder, which contains the R code, I have a description and I have a namespace file. So how does these documentations look? Well, here is when we start using LaTeX. So LaTeX is one of these languages which is there um, to generate all kinds of output formats. If you write your document using the LaTeX layout language, what happens is that you can use a LaTeX compiler to compile this document into a PDF, but you can also compile it into an HTML file. Um, you could even compile it into a Word document um, because there's LaTeX compilers which take a LaTeX document as input and then compile it to a different output format. So how does this RD file look? Well, I have to give the name of the function. So I have slash name. So my first package function. Then I have an alias, which in this case is the same as the name, which is also called my first package function, right? Because I can have a function uh, can have multiple names in R. And we'll see this when we get to um, documenting internal functions, because then we use the alias so that multiple functions get redirected to a single help file. But in this case, I have a single name, I have a single alias, and I have to give it a title. Right, so uh, the title generally in R is um, more or less structured like this. So we have my first package function, then a minus, and then a very short description of what the function does. Then we have a slash description, which is a long description of what our function does. Right, so here I could say something like my first package function, first function in the package. And then the long description would be, um, this is the first, function in my package it doesn't do anything and does not have any input parameters then we have a slash usage section and this is showing the parameters um, so in this case we created a function which did not have any parameters um, so the usage section will just be um, the way or will just be calling the function without any parameters um, I have arguments, so in arguments I need to describe the input parameters or the input arguments to my function. It does not have any, but I need to provide some text. So if, if, if I need to provide text, but I currently don't have the text, um, what I do is I always write something like to do add details, right? Because then when I search through all of the documents, I can just search for to, to do and then I find a list of all of the files where I still need to write some documentation. The details are to provide details about the algorithm. And for example, it could be something like, oh, this function uses um, the method developed by blah, blah, et al. in 2015. The value is describing what is returned. Right, so here you would write the return value of this function is a list which has two elements. The first element of the list contains a vector and the second element of the list contains a matrix. And then you have to provide an example. You always have to provide an example. Without an example, R will not accept your uh, R documentation file. And this is one of these advantages of R. This is why R is so super user friendly. It is because Every function in R, in packages which are uploaded to CRAN, they have at least a single example to show you how to use it. So in this case, I will add a, um, a, 
a more or less a comment line saying uh, an example to execute the function and in this case we are just calling the function with no parameters since it doesn't do anything and it has no parameter and then I have to specify a keyword um, and this is how R figures out if a documentation object is describing a function which is called a method or if it is describing things like data or if it is describing something like a plot routine so the keywords are very limited. You can use data, graphics, methods, and like one or two other ones. But in this case, we are documenting a function. So the keyword is methods. Good. So let's recheck the package, right? So I'm going to do rcmd check your package name. Um, and it checks, it checks. We see a whole bunch of OKs. And that's it you've built your first R package, right? So step one, learn how to build an R package. You now know how to build an R package which contains R code. I don't know what step two is, but step three is profit, right? Um, of course, there's still one step that we need to do. We need to install our newly created package into R because if we haven't uploaded it to cron yet, we can't just use install packages from R. Um, we have to install the package via the command line. So we open up the command line again and then we type rcmd install. So in contrast to check, install is written with capital letters, check is written with, with small letters, um, your package name. And then it will start installing your package. Of course, the next step is to open up R, load your package as a library right so say library your package name i'm going to execute my function and i'm going to do question mark my first package function to look at the help file which has been created and of course the help file in this case is is not very meaningful but at least you can check right so you can check that the function works um, you can look at the help file make sure that everything is okay good so that's it. It's very, very easy to create an R package when you only have R code. Um, it takes you around like 30, 40 minutes um, to make the structure, fill in the description file, fill in the namespace file, and then start just adding your functions that you created one by one. Um, of course, writing the documentation will take a little bit longer. Good. So. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about more advanced packages, right? Because there is a lot more to creating R packages than just this. Um, not when it comes to R packages, which just contain R code, but I wanted to show you guys how you can add your own data into packages. Um, and I wanted to show you guys how you can do some more documentation and also how to use a C or C++ code behind your package. So there are two very special files when you create your R package. Um, both of them are in the manual folder, so it's mon and then slash. And then you have the name of your package, so in this case your package name, minus package.rd. So this is the global package description. Um, this is more or less an index. So this is, um, if you would think about your package or the documentation of your package as a HTML file, right, then this would be the entry. It would be the kind of the index.html uh, to your package, right? So it's a global package description file and it is more or less the index. So you can talk about like, oh, I was bored at work and I wanted to make a package and that's why I created this package. It had five different functions and, and these kinds of things. So and this is just the general information about your package. And then we have another file which is mon your package name, right? Minus internal.rd. So since all functions in R need documentation, but you sometimes don't want to document, document certain functions, right? So imagine that I have a function which is called by the user, um, but then I have like a little function which, which the, the function uses internally, right? So this, this function is never supposed to be called by the user of your package. It's an internal function. It's only used by you 
the author of the package inside of functions which are given to the user then you can document it here right so this is where the alias field comes in is that imagine that I have a um, a very big program Right, so this program does like six different analysis steps one by one. And so step one is data QC, step two is normalization, step three is doing something else. Right, so this this QC step is generally a function, right? Because the, the function that I'm providing to the user just calls the QC function. But the QC function is generally not called by the user. So then what I can do is I can alias the internal or I can alias the QC function to this internal help file. The same thing holds for the normalization step, right? So I can take the normalization function and alias it to the internal help file, which means that when people ask for the help file, they just get a help file which says, well, this is just internal functions. There is going to be no documentation and you're more or less on your own. So all functions need documentation, small internal functions, which are generally not used or not called by the user, can be stored here. Um, and we can use the alias field for that. So let's first look at the first one, so the global package description index. Um, this is how it looks like. So again, we have a name, your package name minus package. We have an alias, which is just your package name. Um, we have a doc type in this case, so the doc type is package. So this tells R that it is a description of the package. So it, it uses a slightly different format compared to the standard format um, that it uses for help files um, because this is the main entry file. Um, then we have a title, we have a description, we have details, and that's it. There's no example. Um, there is no um, return value because we're not describing a function, right? We're describing the package itself. Of course, we have an author section. So there's an author section which lists uh, the uh, author and which lists the maintainer. Uh, Paolo. Hey, Paolo. Welcome, welcome. Um, yeah, sorry, I haven't responded to your comment yet. I, I saw it, but I was on a conference. Um, but yeah, thanks for leaving a comment. Um, I'm actually interested in the um, KMER stuff that you were proposing. Um, so... Could you send me an email with some more information? Because I, I think it will be interesting to see if I can make like a short lecture-ish out of it. Um, so, but welcome to the lecture. Um, and in this case, um, the keyword is not methods, but the keyword is package, right? Since this describes the whole package, um, w it's, it's a different keyword. Just to let R know that um, it's not describing a function, but it is describing the package. So the internal package looks like this, right? So this is the file, like I told you guys, which describes functions or documents functions which are generally not called by the user. So it's a very short file, but generally if you have a lot of internal functions, there will be a lot of aliases in there. So the name of it is your package name minus internal. It has a title. The general title is always internal functions. And then you alias all of the different functions that you do not want to document. The rule is, is that you cannot export a function to the user using the namespace file when it is documented in the internal. So in this case, I'm aliasing three internal functions called my internal function one, my internal function two, and so on. Generally, this would be like um, internal.qc, internal.normalize, um, internal.calculate some statistics, right? So it's, it's generally um, a lot of functions that are, um, that are more or less described here. Then you have the description. Uh, the description is very basically internal functions. These are generally not called by the user. Um, you have to specify the author. Um, in this case, it's me, so I just write it down um, so I write down my name, my email address, um, and then I have keyword, and the keyword for this file is internal, right? So there's two keywords here. So the one is keyword package, which is the main index page of the package. And then we have the internal function. So the internal functions are not called by the user, but since every, doc every function that you write in your package needs documentation, in this case, we are going to link these functions which 
we do not want to write documentation for because they're generally not used by the user we are just going to link them all to the internal package uh, keyword using aliases good all right so if you want to add data data goes into a folder called data with small letters again I don't know why they didn't decide to capitalize everything um, because the description, the namespace, the R folder is, um, but for some reason the data and the manual folder are just small letters. So um, it, of course I, when I want to add data I need to have some data. Um, so in this case I'm just generating a random matrix, 100 rows, 10 columns, uh, 1000 random values in there, um, and I'm just going to save this random matrix into a file called randommatrix.rdata. So again, the, the file extension here is sensitive, right? An rd file where the d is small is a r documentation file. An rdata file, data is capitalized. This contains data um, that is generally given to the user. And again, every object in your package that you are giving to the user needs a documentation object. So if I save this random matrix.rdata, I also have to create a new file in my manual folder called random matrix.rd. So the random matrix.rd file looks like this because it has a slightly different structure. You can see that from the different doc type. So the name of it is random matrix. Again, it has an alias. You can use aliases to um, provide the same data using different names, if you, if you so please. Um, the doc type is data. It has a title. It has a description. It has a usage section instead of an, uh, a usage section. So this is how you... Uh, make the data available to the user, right? So if the user types data random matrix into R, it will load the data file. Um, the format describes the format. So for example, this is a matrix with 10 rows, uh, 10 columns and 100 rows. Um, it contains numeric values. The details are there to highlight some details about the data. For example, it could be that part of the data was collected in 2015 as part of this international collaboration or international project, right? That goes into the details. If the data has been published before, you can add references as well. So, for example, if you uploaded your data to something like Figshare um, or you uploaded it to other data repositories, then you can add references towards these repositories so that people know how to cite the data or cite the paper that you published about the data. Data also needs an example. The examples for data are generally just data random matrix. Right? It's the, the examples are generally the same as the usage um, because there's no real example on how to do the data. You could give it a small example here on how to subset it or um, other things, but this is generally not, not the most interesting part. The keyword here is data sets. So, and again, this needs to be written exactly. Um, so and there needs to be an S at the end and you cannot use a capital, um, which is, uh, it's very precise, right? Making a, a changing a small letter to a capital letter will already be bad. It will not accept that. It will not recognize it. So the keywords is data sets. Good. So now we know how to create a package, create the namespace file, create the description file, create manuals, create the R files. The R files can only contain functions. The manuals need to follow the structure, be written in more or less this LaTeX dialect. We know how to add data to it. But besides the tests that we have in the individual manual files, right? Because the, the examples in the manual files, when you check your package, R actually executes the examples. So it executes the examples to see if the examples really work. Right? so that the example doesn't generate an error. However, if you want to add more tests, you can create a folder called tests. And our files put in this folder will be executed automatically during building of the package. 
So you might have, um, hey, you might have a new algorithm, and when the input to this algorithm is 15, then you expect a certain output. So you can put that in this test folder. So to make sure that every time you change some code in your package or you're making a new version of the package, that you do not break um, the fundamental algorithm. Right, so it's, it's really to provide more or less a safety harness for when you're coding, every time you install your package, it will run all of the examples, making sure that every example compiles and works, and it will also run all of the tests located in the test folder. Um, so how do these tests look? Well, I just have a basic, very bad test here. So this is test 0001.r. Um, again, you add a header to any R file that you create. Um, and this is a very bad test, right? Because this just randomly stops, right? 20% of the time, I'm drawing a number which is greater than 0 0.8, and then it will just throw a stop error. But that is generally how these tests look. So these tests, they do, they call one of your functions, right? So they call a function that you created. Um, and if the output is not what you expect it to be, um, then you throw a stop error and then the package is stopped there. So it will directly stop execution. It will warn you saying that I encountered an error in test 001. This is the error message. The error message in this case being unsuccessful test. So make sure that when you write tests, right, and you are using random numbers as input, that you set your seed, right? Because if I would set my seed to a fixed number at the beginning of the test, then this test would either always succeed or it would always fail, right? Because by setting the seed, I'm setting the random ge number generator to a known point and drawing one random number after setting my seed will always give me the same random number. Um, so hey, in this case, I didn't do that, but generally when you use random numbers in your test, which is perfectly possible, make sure that you set your seed so that it will always draw the exact same random number. All right, so now the last folder of the day. It is the SRC folder, the source folder. In the source folder, you can put Fortran code, C code, or C++ code. So this is code that needs to be compiled into one of these dynamic link libraries, right? So these DLL files, or if you're on Linux, they're called SO, shared object files. If you're on Mac, they're called dilibs um, for dynamic libraries. Um, but this code um, can be in in, in this SR, this code needs to be in the SRC folder. Yes, hello. Hello, moderator. Very good that you're joining us. Um, so I just want to give you a very, very basic example on how you can use C++ code and call it from R um, and then have the results back to R, right? So we're just going to make one round trip where we have a function which calls some C++ code, or C code in this case, not C++, but just basic C code. And then what happens is, is that we give the answer, which is computed in C, back to R. Good. So we need to create a C code file, right? So the C code file that I'm creating is called call test C from R.C, right? So it's in the source folder. It's called, it has this name, and what is it going to do? Well, it's going to be a very, very basic example. Of course, every C file also has a header. So in C, um, comments are slightly different, right? In R, we use the uh, hashtag for a comment line. In C, you use um, uh, forward slash forward slash. And then everything behind it gets ignored. Um, and uh, slash star, star slash, this denotes a block of uh, comments. So we're going to write a little C function. And I don't want to exact or explain too much on how you exactly write C or C++, um, because that, that's a whole different topic. Um, but here we're just going to make a very, very small piece of C++ code. So here it says void, right? So void means that this function that we are defining, the function that we're defining is called r underscore add, right? So it adds two numbers together. 
And this function is going to be void, which means that it does not return anything. You can also see that there is no return statement in the function. Right, so in, in C, you specify the return value, the name of the function, and then the function parameters. So in this case, our function will have three parameters. It will have a pointer to an integer, a pointer to an integer b, and it will have a pointer to an integer results. So c uses pointers. So pointers are more or less like little arrows that point to a memory location, and this memory location has a certain uh, format on how to interpret it. Right, so an integer is a whole number. It cannot hold a 5.3, but it can hold an, the number 7. Right, so what this is going to do, it's, it's going to take this pointer to A, so we're going to follow the pointer to A, then we're going to add the following of pointer to B, so we're going to look into A, what is stored there, and then we're going to add the value in B to it. Right, so we're just going to dereference the pointer, look at the value of A, then add the value of B to it, and then we're going to store this where the pointer of results is pointing to. So all of these three memory locations are managed by R. So this is, the, the, the data never leaves the R allocated memory. It, it just, the C code just looks into the memory which R reserved for these things. Uh, it's going to add them together, put it back in results. So what this function does, it takes two whole numbers, adds them together, and then puts the result into this uh, variable called result. Good, so this is our C code. So now we need some R code, right? Because we need to call this code, right? Because otherwise it doesn't work. Right, so again we create a, um, an R file, um, so in the R folder we put a new file called call test C from R.R. .R. So again we have the R header saying when it was made, um, and here we now have call test C from R. Right, so it is a function which takes two numbers, number A and number B, and it will return the result. Right, so it, it won't put it in a new variable, it will just return the result. But we need to define a memory location where C, where the C code can store its result. So that's what we're doing here. We're defining a new variable, an internal variable called result, and we're putting the value zero in it. So how do I now call C code? Well, in R that's relatively easy, you just say dot C, so big C, right? So call C code, which code do I want to call? Well, that's the name of the function, so r underscore add, so that's the function that I want to call. And then I want to transform a to an integer, I want to transform b to an integer, and I want to say result is as integer result because I need to provide our, our, I need to provide the C code with a little box where it can put the result. So this will call the C code, it will provide two values, and it provides an, an empty box for storing the results. And then it will just return everything from this call. So this calls the C code and returns the result. Of course we have to add a manual file for this function, because every R function which is available in the package, needs to be uh, having a documentation object. Furthermore, we have to update our namespace file, because in the namespace file, we have to mention that we now have a second function in our package, because we only had one function before, but we now have two. So updating the namespace file is now requiring two additional lines. First, we have to tell R that we have C code, so that we want to use the dynamic library which is being built from this C code, right? Because the, when we compile our package, or when we build our package now, the first thing it will do, it will take the C code, compile it into a DLL, so we have to tell R that, okay, so when, when you load my package, use this dynamic library, so the dynamic library is being built by R automatically, 
but it will need to specify the name so it's the same name as the package so in our case it's your package name I'm going to export my first package function because I already had that function in my package and then I'm going to export this call test C from R right so this is the new function that we made um, could you kind could uh, kindly could you tell me when you broadcast your lecture live well now and every Thursday um, at 2 p.m. Central European time um, and generally I will actually um, do these like announcements before not so much announcement but I will create the live stream before um, and then um, but generally at 2 uh, on, a, on a Thursday uh, we stream but that that might change in the future but generally if you just go to the uh, main well not website if you go to my main YouTube profile um, then if I am live streaming soon then you will see the live stream thing um, but I forgot to do it yesterday or the day before so I only did it this morning like half an hour before the stream started um, I created the, the live stream itself um, so I don't think that I gave people enough warning to follow the live stream good so use din lib right specifies which dynamic library I want to load so in this case I'm telling R load your package name DLL and export um, exposes the call test C from R to the user right just like the export of my first package function did that of course I need to provide a manual file so in this case I have two arguments right so the only difference with the previous file is that now we have this argument section oh this is really small um, so this argument section says call test C from R it has a parameter A and a parameter B um, and you have to specify slash item A and then give the description of A slash item B and then the description of B right so the first number to add up the second number to add up and of course we have an example right so the example is just calling the function um, using the numbers 5 and 10 and then of course since the examples are actually tests in R uh, if the result is not equal to 15 right then then there's something wrong with the code that I wrote in C so I'm going to explicitly add a test saying that if the result of adding 5 and 10 together is not equal to 15 then I'm going to throw a stop error and that is just to provide myself with a harness right because if I update my code in the future I might mistakenly change the plus symbol by a multiplication symbol and if I do that mistakenly then when I build my package it will run the example and it will give me an error so it's just it's really nice to have like a lot of these um, examples which kind of harness your code right with known input known output good so I have to test my package so I do an RCMD check um, this should not throw any notes or warnings um, if there are notes or warnings read the note read the warning fix it and then I'm going to say RCMD install your package name um, and now we can see if our C code works right so we can say library your package name and then we just say call test C from R we provide A being 5 B being 10 and then you see it provides us with the two numbers that we input it and it also returns the result in a little list good so some common mistakes when you are building an R package when you install your package so when you do R CMD install from the command line make sure R is not running while you install a package if that is the case then the package will not really be installed right it will it the code might not be updated and this is not the worst thing in the world but it can confuse you quite a lot right because if you have R open you install your package you go to R you try your new function then it says oh function not found this can be a source of like real pain um, so every time that you install a package make sure that R is closed so close your R window close R studio or whatever you're using to run R um, always check your package before installing 
So always run rcmd check before you run an rcmd install. Because the install doesn't run all of the tests. The check does. It will go into the test folder and will run all of the tests, making sure that everything works. Add enough testing. Use the documentation for very quick and simple tests and the test directory is there if you want to do more thorough tests. Of course, you have to be able to test your package. But in general, any function that you write, you can write a test saying that if the input is 5, 10 and 7, then this needs to be the output. And this will really help you, especially when you're building a package which you are maintaining over like a five or six year period or a 10 year period, right? Because in 10 years time, you're not going to know exactly what every function is supposed to do. And by having these tests, it gives you the flexibility to look at the code, change the code, see if all of the tests work. And if all of the tests work and you have added enough tests, then you know that you did not break anything. And this is really, really useful um, and it's kind of this common strategy of like test-driven development. Um, so test-driven development means that you are writing a test first and then writing the code to implement passing the test. Good, so with that out of the way, we will have our first um, break or probably the only break for today because um, the rest of the lecture is going to be the overview of all of the other lectures. Um, so I'm going to go through all of the 10 lectures that we had and I'm going to tell you guys what I think is important um, and what you should know for the exam. So let's do the first break. I forgot what the first break is going to be. I think it's going to be ducks, but I'm not 100% sure. So don't blame me if it's not ducks. Um, and we will have some music. The music is called Barn from my stream deck. And I will run out, get myself some fresh coffee, and I will see you guys in 7 to 10 minutes. Good. So enjoy the ducks and be right back.
Alright, I didn't make it back in time. It was a very short little movie. Still waiting for the Tasmanian Devil. We did Tasmanian Devils. Um, when did we do Tasmanian Devils? Um, I'll have to look that up. Um, let me actually go back to lecture layout so that you guys can see me as well. I'm just gonna quickly look. Um, because I, I, I knew I did Tasmanian Devils. Um, not your, yeah, my videos. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba, live streams. I think we did Tasmanian Devils in the linear mixed model lecture, if I'm not mistaking. I'm just going to quickly look. Um, where is the break? Right, look, 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 look. Uh, I'm going to take this one so you guys can see. Like Lecture number nine. Tasmanian Devils. Look. Bottle drinking Tasmanian Devils and, and fighting Tasmanian Devils. So we did it. I, 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 I heard you. We're still seeing your terminal. <coughs> All right. It's the wrong chat that I'm reading. So let's put this one back. But yeah, we did, uh, we did Tasmanian Devils. So, uh, can't, you can't blame me for not doing them. So, why do we have two cameras? Yeah, why, why not? Last lecture, right? So, um, yeah, it seems that people didn't watch all of the lectures, but that's okay, that's okay. Sure, I lost it. Uh, yeah, so lecture number nine is Tasmanian Devils. Um, let me mute myself, I really have to cough. All right, so I'm back. Um, yeah, so we, we did Tasmanian Devils. Um, I think you're reading the wrong chat. Yeah, yeah, because that's very confusing, right? When I have, like, you, can, you can't really see how many screens I have open. Uh, I could put it like this, right? So that you can kind of see. Um, but this is the YouTube live chat thing, and then I have YouTube open, of course, and then the, this is the overview, and then the linear mix models, and besides that, I have like all of the other windows open so that OBS can capture them, like the lecture itself, and um, of course, you, you always need to have this thing open to take a look at your CPU usage and GPU to make sure that you don't overload the stuff. Like, streaming is a lot more involved than what you guys just see on the screen. So, um, that's why you actually have the second cam today. So that you guys can see what I am doing. Um, good, 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 good. So, and, uh, and, and the second camera is nice because I can just do like this, right? So, and it's a little bit different. A little bit different today. Since it's the last time. So, all right. Ah, last lecture, be yeah, kind of like the, is the, no, it's not the last video, but it's the last lecture that I'm doing for the Humboldt um, since I am moving to a new job. I will be starting a job in Newcastle at Northumbria University and, well, it's the last lecture of the lecture series, um, but I'm not going to stop making videos, so there will probably be more different videos. So like the one that I did about monkeypox. Um, and I'm thinking about um, inviting some of my friends from bioinformatics to have a couple of like talks, more like a podcasty kind of format. I tried it last time with um, at the end of the R lecture. No, not at the end of the bioinformatics lecture. We had an invited guest speaker. Um, Thursdays will never be the same. Yeah, I'm very sorry. Um, depending on how my schedule looks like, I might actually stream next Thursday or the Thursday afterwards. Um, but it's the last lecture of the R course, and um, I'm thinking about doing something like um, showing you guys how to program in like D or C++ or perhaps some Python. Um, because of course I, I program in a lot of different languages. Because bioinformatics is not just learning R and doing one language. It's uh, it's it's doing much, much more. Let me actually move this one a little bit. Oh, don't fall. Don't fall over. 
Oh, uh, no. Second camera. Oh, you shouldn't do a second camera. All right. But yeah, so the, the idea is, is that I do continue streaming because I do love streaming and uh, I, I do probably going to teach some different things. So good look in the new job. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited well excited about it yes i am i'm also a little bit sad since it's been eight and a half years of me working here so um it's a, it's a big change for me as well so um we'll have to see anyway overview lecture right so i am going to go through all of the 11 lectures that we had um the first 10 of course plus the our package lecture that we just had um, and I'm just going to highlight what I think is is important and what I think um, deserves to be on the exam so I'm just going to have one slide for each of the lectures and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we already talked about and highlight what might be on the exam so what do you need to study everything on the slides so if it is on the slide it is fair game for me to ask you guys about it and besides the slides there is going to be the pdf file so the lecture 10 mixed models by bodo winter um, i might ask one or two questions about it and i always say that but i almost never do um, i have to be honest about that hold up big news how do you mean big news have to share it right now. All right, so what's the big news? I'm, I'm waiting for the big news. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> oh, home office mail is in. Oh, very good, very good. So did you get accepted or rejected? Both of them is big news. Um. <laughs> Oscar got a girlfriend. No, Oscar didn't get a girlfriend. Oscar, Oscar's my cat, by the way. Um, but, uh, so fingers crossed, fingers crossed. What's it going to be? It's going to be accepted, rejected. Visa is granted. Perfect. That is so perfect. I actually got my visa news a couple of days ago. So that means that we can actually go to the UK and, and work there. And that's, that's good. All right, congratulations. I uh, I probably have like an audio effect for that. Uh, let me. <laughs> I I don't use the stream deck enough. Like uh, your application has been successful. You have been granted permission to enter and stay in the UK from the fourth of August. Yay, very good, very good, very good. I'm I'm really happy about that. At least then I don't have to cancel the other job. Good, so let's circle back and continue with, uh, with the lecture. So what do you need to study? Everything on the slides is fair game for me to ask. So if it's on a slide, then I might ask a question about it. Um, and the PDF, although I generally... Do not ask too many questions about the Bodo Winter PDF. But I do want you guys to know what a mixed model is, what a random intercept is, what a random slope is, um, what the difference is, how you write them down in R. Um, but I'm not going to ask anything about the data set, right? I'm not going to ask um, about the analysis itself. It's just about how we do the analysis in, in R. So good, 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 good. So the next slide will mention what I think is important. So for lecture number one, so we did a very short overview of the history, right? So I talked to you guys about Charles Babbage. I talked about Konrad Zeus, about the first computer. So there will definitely be a question about that. And one of the things that I can tell you in advance is that I love to ask questions about people who won a Nobel Prize um, because I'm still hoping um, don't forget to leave a new email for contact. In my email address will be exactly the same. I'm continuing using my Gmail because um, that's 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 my email. So um, always has been for the last eighteen years or something. So so yeah, and and do send me a mail about the uh, about the K-MERS because I think it will make an interesting lecture on how to do K-MERS analysis. So um, the history. 
I will ask definitely one or two questions about the history. Um, so just go through the slides, see which people are mentioned, um, Google them a little bit, see if they've won a Nobel Prize, because if they won a Nobel Prize, then they are definitely going to be asked about. Um, there's going to be a question about why are. And generally the question um, is going to be something like, name three reasons to use R. And to be very clear, when I do an exam question and I ask you to name X things, so if I ask for three things and you write down four, the whole answer is wrong because you did not understand the question. If I'm asking for three things, I want to hear or read three things on the answer. <laughs> <coughs> I am so sorry. Ah, oh, very tickly throat. Um, I had some water, but it's okay. I will survive. So if I ask for three things, don't write four. Writing down two, will still give you two thirds of the points. Writing down one will still make you eligible for one third of the points. But if you write down four things when I'm asking for three, there will be no points given. And that is just because I am not going to pick and choose which are the three right answers. Ah, one SARS-CoV-2 test coming up. I actually am testing myself every day because of the conference last week and I haven't tested positive yet. Um, so I'm very positive that I'm not positive. So why R? Know a couple of reasons on why you should use R. What are the advantages? Also know what are the disadvantages of R. So know how to use R as a calculator and there will definitely be a question about Euclidean division. Um, there will be definitely a question about the built-in constants, like the month.up for the abbreviation of the 12 months, um, or, about the pi, or about pi, or these kinds of things. There will be questions definitely about the different data types. So the different data types are numeric vectors, matrices, and these kinds of things. I also want you to be able to index a vector or a matrix. Right, so if I give you uh, a vector um, description, right, so vector 1, arrow, C, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and I'm asking you guys select the 5th, the 8th, and the 9th element from this matrix, then you should be able to do that. Um, there might be a question about variables, but um, I think that we've seen enough variables that people know that it's just a name that you can assign to to something, right? So you can you can put something in a variable. You can use the variable without knowing what's in it. Um, so that's 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 what I want you guys to know. So for lecture two, we started off doing variables again, right? So a variable is like a box. You can put things in. You can use the box without knowing what's in there. Um, but there will be some very small control structures. Right, so I want you guys to know how to write an if statement, a switch statement, um, write a while loop and write a for loop. These won't be very elaborate questions, right? They will be at most four or five lines of code um, during the exam that you have to write for a single question, right? It's not gonna be um, write an algorithm to compute the greatest common divisor or something like that. No, they will be very, small questions like write a while loop which prints out the numbers 10 to minus 5 um, make sure that there's a new line after each 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 line that that is being printed i want you guys to know the difference between a statement and an expression so there might be a question saying that is this a statement or is this an expression um, there will be a question about advanced looping, like how to use the apply function or how to use the lapply function. Um, of course, we also talked about functions a little bit. I told you a little bit about the theory behind functions and about what the scope of a variable is, right? So that if you have a function, you can define an internal variable. This internal variable is not visible from the outside. <coughs> It's positive to be negative. Yeah, it's definitely positive to be negative. 
and I, I was very careful at the, at, at the conference. So I, I wore a mask almost everywhere. Um, it's just that you have like the shared dinners where it's really hard because you can't eat with a mask on. Someone should find a solution to that. Um, escaping the inevitable, be sure to know how to escape and what to escape. Right, so you can have, for example, an enter, which is a slash n, right? So escaping is by putting a slash in front of a modifier. Um, and of course, the slash itself needs to be escaped as well. And be able to know the different random distributions, right? Know that there's a R norm for selecting from Gaussian distributions and uh, R unif. So RUNIF for uniform distributions. Um, there's Poisson distributions and these kinds of things. I want you to be able to read in data. So when I show you, for example, a little piece of a data file and I ask you write a read table function or a read CSV function that reads in this table with the correct headers and row name specification, then you should be able to do that. Um, there will be a little bit of subsetting of data, so know that the in is there so that you can ask questions which elements of this vector are in another vector. Um, the which takes a vector with logical values and then gives you back the indexes which are true. Um, and know that you can write data using the write table and using the cut function. So there might be one or two trick questions there, but I generally avoid trick questions. Um, we also talked about Biomart in lect lecture three. So know what the difference is between a Mart. So a Mart is a data provider. Attributes are the things that you want to retrieve. Filters are the things that you are going to specify, right? So a filter might be chromosomal location, and then the value might be chromosome one from 1 million base pairs to 2 million base pairs. But a filter might also be uh, a G name and then of course the value is going to be the value of G name. <clears throat> so know how to use Biomart. And I think that Biomart is important because it's um, the R course is R for biological sciences or plant and animal sciences. Um, so Biomart is one of these packages which is really important when you do biological research. Lecture four was about univariate versus bivariate statistics. So we talked a lot about univariate statistics, right? What is the mean, the median, the mode? Um, we talked about the, the dispersion measurements, like the ranges and the quantiles. Um, we talked about spread, like variance, standard deviation, and know how to compute these things using R. Um, we also talked about shape, like skewness and kurtosis of data. And here um, it is important to know which packages are available and which functions you can use to, for example, um, assess if a normal distribution is skewed or if it shows positive or negative kurtosis. Um, during lecture four, we also talked about plots. Um, so know how to generate a basic box plot, a histogram or an image plot in R. We also talked about PAR to set global parameters um, like the size of the, the points, the size of the letters, um, but also know how to use PAR to make like a dual plot, right? So to have one window with two plots in there um, using MF row or MF call. So in lecture five, we talked about classes of objects so that you can actually add a class to an, a list, for example, and then you have your own default functions, right? You can write your own summary function so that when people type the name of the variable holding an object, which has a type that you defined, um, that you can print out um, a little overview of the object instead of having thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code uh, or thousands and thousands of lines of data run run in front of your nose. Um, not only the summary function but also the print and the plot function and the image function can be overloaded using using this. Um, then know what the artist palette model entails and that base R uses the artist palette model. Right, so you start with the background and you work towards the foreground, right? So you set up your axis, um, then you plot, for example, your points, and then you draw a line which goes on top of the points, and then you draw an arrow which goes on top of all of the other things that you already drew. 
Um, they, we also discussed some important plot parameters, like know how to change your axis, um, know how to change the size of the, the font uh, that you're using, and, and these kinds of things. Of course, you don't have to know that CX being 18 is a field dot and these kinds of things. That goes way too far. But, but know that CX allows you to set which type of plotting symbol you are using. Um, well, we discussed some functions for plots, things like lines, points, text, uh, text outside of the axis using mText, the title, the axis. Um, and also know that the width function can be very useful. Right, the width function allows you to take a matrix <clears throat> and make all of the columns of the matrix into variables. Um, and also know that this is the reason why there is a requirement on column names uh, of a matrix. Right, because R wants column names of a matrix to be proper variable names. That means that it cannot start with a number. Um, you cannot have like a weird symbols in there and these kinds of things. Um, and also we had like an overview of what makes a good plot, right? So make sure that your axes have units on them. Uh, make sure that there's a legend which explains all of the elements in the plot um, and these kinds of, of tips to make good looking plots. In lecture six, we talked about common microarray workflow. Uh, we talked a lot about different normalization techniques and know why we normalize, right? Know that there are normalizations of scores and normalizations of ratios and know why we are normalizing in general. Uh, we also talked about log ratios. Um, and this is of course, because if you have two variables which have a very different range, um, you can take the log ratio of the two ranges and then still end up with numbers which are linearly related, right? So this has to do with uh, the die bias in, um, in microarrays where the green die has a much larger dynamic range uh, than the red die. The red die is a much smaller dynamic. Uh, we talked about t-tests. What are the assumptions underlying a t-test? So have one of the assumptions underlying the t-test is, is that it's a normal distribution, that samples are independent, um, and all of these things. We talked about correlation as well. Um, so correlation is a measurement of how one variable reacts when another variable changes. Um, so hey, if one variable goes up, the other one goes up as well. Um, and then the correlation will tell you how strong this uh, relationship between these two variables is. Um, we talked about multiple testing and things like type 1 and type 2 errors, right? So type 1 error is saying that um, to, a, to a woman that um, you are not pregnant while she actually is, while a type 2 error is saying to a man that he is pregnant while he never could be. So more or less, right? We have a couple of slides about type 1 and type 2 errors. So type 1 errors are false negative, type 2 errors are false, no, other way around. Type 1 errors are false positives, type 2 errors are false negatives. Um, and I also showed you where you can get a lot of free microarray data. Um, so know the two databases that provide you with free microarray data and also know the difference between them. On lecture seven, we talked about algorithms and design patterns. I won't ask a lot of questions about this. Um, I also probably won't ask you to write a recursive algorithm, but know that recursion exists and know that recursion has a single parameter which always goes up or always goes down towards the base case and that this variable is called the recursion invariant. So it is, for example, um, x, right? And then when we call the same function in the return statement, we call it on x minus 1. So then x is the recursion invariant. Um, <clears throat> and also know that you can have indirect recursion, so which means that you have one function calling another function, which calls the original function. Right, so that it's kind of a loop of two functions calling each other. Um, but yeah, know what recursion is, know what the base case is, know that the recursion invariant is the variable that counts down or counts up towards the base case and makes it so that recursion stops at a certain point. 
So when we talked about lecture eight, we talked about regression. We talked a great deal about regression because it's one of these fundamental algorithms to analyze data and to, to find relationships or associations between variables. Um, know how the regression model works, right? That we have unknown parameters, which are beta one, beta two, beta three. And this is the thing that we want to know, right? We want to know how strongly something some variable influences our um, response variable, so the dependent variable, right? And these, these variables, which are the things that we want to estimate, are called the independent variables, and they are denoted x, and the dependent variables, the thing that we want to predict, which is called y. So we talked about single linear regression. We talked about that every beta that you calculate comes with a confidence interval. Um, <clears throat> And that this is just um, a, a statistical association, right? So it's not the truth because all models are wrong. Some are useful, um, but had that, that every parameter that you estimate comes with a certain confidence interval. Um, we talked about creating regression plots, like plotting a independent variable against a dependent variable and then adding in the regression line. Um, we talked about multiple linear regression, where you don't have a single independent variable, but where you have multiple independent variables, right? Where you have, for example, the body weight of a mouse is determined by the sex of the mouse, the age of the mouse, um, perhaps its feeding behavior. And so then we have multiple independent variables. For each of these, we want to know the effect on the dependent variable, and then it's called multiple linear regression. We also talked about regression models, which in first instance do not seem to be linear, like quadratic regression or e to the power of um, beta x, right? But these are still linear regressions. So you can have a model where you say my dependent variable is determined by the body weight to the power of 2, or my, uh, my body weight is determined by the sex um, to the power of three, right? So there, there, there can be quadratics or to the power of three or e to the power of x um, in regression models, and this still is a valid linear regression model, although it might not look linear. And know that you can use the curve function to plot things like quadratic regression. So in lecture nine, we talked about linear mixed effect analysis. Um, we talked about the random effects and that when we do an LME, a linear mixed effect model, um, we do this because one of the assumptions of a standard linear model is violated. For example, we have measured the same individual multiple times, so that means that all, not all measurements are independent of each other. Or we measured brothers and sisters, right? So these individuals are not independent measurements since a brother and a sister share 50% of their genome. Um, and this needs to be accounted for into the model because otherwise you would overestimate your significance. So know how to do these linear mixed effect models in R um, and know the difference between a random intercept model where for each individual you allow it to have its own intercept, right? Its own mean of a certain variable and that there is something like a random slope model where you allow the slope of the variables <coughs> Oh, my voice is getting really bad. So a random slope model is when you when you estimate multiple slopes, um, each individual is allowed to have its own effect, right? So if we think about um, body weight and, for example, um, your food intake, right? Then we might allow every individual to have an individual food intake slope, where for some individuals, um, taking in a lot of food will lead to not a lot of increase in body weight, but for other individuals, eating a lot of food might create a lot of intake or a lot of effect on body weight. And of course, the PDF um, is part of the thing that you want to learn. So the, the Bodo Winter um, um, PDF is part of, of the exam. Good, so in lecture 10, we talked about different linear models, so even more complex linear models where um, we have not a, a response variable which might not be 
a normal distribution or a response variable which might not even be continuous right so in the case of a case control study where some people are responders and other people are non-responders or if we think about a survival curve um, where some people uh, or some mice die during the experiments and others survive, right? So if you are a survivor or a, a, a non-survivor, then we have to use different, um, different models. We have to use link functions. So we then tell the linear model saying that, well, the response that we are looking at, the independent variable, is not a normal distribution. So and know the difference between a standard linear model, a linear mixed effect model, which is fitted using LMER, and then we have a generalized linear model. So a generalized linear model allows you to have a response variable, which is not a, a, a continuous variable. And for example, a Poisson distribution. <coughs> if we are using a generalized mixed, a linear mixed effect model, then generally if we have multiple factor levels in the dependent variable right we had the example where we have for example your admission into the university being determined if you are a, from a certain level of high school right you might be from a top tier five percent high school or you might be from a top 50 percent high school so the example was we had multiple levels of high schools right so so multiple factors um, that you can use the vault test to group these into a single probability value. Like how likely is it that the high school that you went to is changing the admission? Because when we are doing a factor test, hey, when we are using different levels in R, then every level gets its own beta estimate and gets its own p-value. But by using a vault test, we can combine these effects and these p-values into a single effect and a single p-value. We also talked about common idioms, um, so things like melting and casting, going from a wide format to a long format. Um, and we also discussed a bunch of other idioms, so be able to use them um, and be able to, to know or recognize some of these idioms. So when should I use certain types of code? So in lecture 11, which we just did, we talked about how to create a package. And so what do you need? Could be a question on the exam. And hey, you should then answer, well, you need R, you need R tools, and you need MCTEX. And you should also know why you need it, right? So you need R to, to load your package eventually. You need R tools to compile the code, be it R code or be it C++ code. And you need MCTEX for the documentation files. Um, know what the difference is between a description file and a namespace file and know that there are some special files and also know the different folders, right? So if I ask you, what is the folder called holding the documentation, then you have to say MAN. Good. So with that, um, for me, there's nothing left but to wish you all very, very good luck on the exam. Register for the exam if you haven't. Um, the exam will be on the 28th, I'm saying from my mind. Let me actually look that up. Um, let me log in. And let's see. Vorlesungsfest. No, um, Leistungstermin 1. So the exam will be on the... 28th of July. So I wish everyone good luck on the exam. The exam is not hard. If you followed the lectures, um, then you should be able to pass the exam um, with at least a 3.0 or higher or lower in the German system because it, it works the other way around. Um, but it, it's not a hard exam. Um, but it does check if you listen to the lectures if you did some of the assignments. Um, so of course there might also be some questions about the uh, the assignment. Good and then it's your time to give me some remarks, some feedback. Um, I see that there's not a lot of students currently attending which is logical because it's like 27 degrees and sunny outside so I 
when I was a student, you, when the weather was like this, I would not attend lectures as well, which is perfectly fine. Um, but if you if you want to leave some feedback, um, and I'm not looking for positive feedback, I'm looking for things that I should improve, um, things that you think should be better, um, then let me know in the comments or throw it in chat now. Um, but yeah, like I'm always like feedback is the thing that helps me improve for next year. Um, and uh, that's always good. So if you, if you say, well, um, you should do this differently or when you are showing us R, it's too small or these kinds of things, um, then, um, it's good to let me know in the comments. And like Misha said before about the Corona test, it's, uh, it's, it's positive to be negative. Uh, can I go for exam if I start watching now? Um, yes, if you are registered to the Humboldt University, you probably could join the exam still. Um, but if you are studying at a different German university, then it's going to be hard to make the first uh, round because then you still have to register as a Nebenhörer and these kinds of things. Um, but y y yeah, if you, in theory, if you would just start learning like four days before the exam and you would put the whole YouTube movies in like two times speed, then you could watch everything in like 20 hours, right? Because it's kind of 40 hours in total. Um, and then if you do it at two times speed, it's 20 hours. Um, and then you can do the assignments in the evening. Uh, then you should be perfectly able to, to join the exam and, uh, and, and pass it, right? The, it's the, it, my goal is not to have you guys fail the exam. My goal is just to make sure that you attended the lectures and that you know the basics of R so that you can write a for loop, um, that you can select things from your matrix, that you can make a subset, that you can load in files, that you can write out files, make some basic plots, um, understand how a linear model works. Um, so it's not, it's not for me to make it difficult for you. Um, I want you guys to pass and I want you guys to get a good grade. Um, so that, that's my goal. Good. Um, so yeah, if you have any feedback, um, hey, like it's positive to be negative. So let me know and say, well, um, dude, you're talking way too fast or, um, I don't know. I don't know if, if there's anything that you don't like about the lectures, then, uh, do let me know and, and don't, don't keep quiet because if you are bothered by something, then other people might be bothered by it as well. And then it's good to let me know so I can change it. Um, so with that, we are at the end of the lecture. So it means this exam is paid. I live in France. Sorry if I attended your lectures, max one hour. So yeah, the problem is, is that the lectures are given as part of the lecture series for the Humboldt University. So that means that anyone studying at a German university can do the exam. You just have to register as a Nebenhör. Um, which is a uh, filling in a form. I think you pay like 15 euros in administrative cost and that's it. If you are par if you are enrolled at the Humboldt University, joining the exam costs you nothing. Um, um, so it means this exam is paid. I live in France, sorry, I've attended your lectures max one hour and I've registered on Moodle, but I don't know university procedure. Yeah, so then, it, then it's going to be relatively hard to do the exam um, because I can only give credits to people who are in Germany because I'm certified as a teacher in Germany, but not in France. Um, so, but then like you're more than welcome to follow the lectures and learn stuff from it. Um, great lectures. Hope you make many more love bioinformatics and maybe some real practice. It would be great. Thanks a lot for sharing your knowledge. Yeah, no, you're welcome. So, um, but Chanawas, yeah, it, it, it's going to be hard getting your credits approved for a French university. Um, it is possible, but it is difficult. Um, so, um, that, that's the thing. 
I didn't do the exam to learn a lot. Yeah, no, but that's the thing, right? Like the idea is just that I stream them to make them available for everyone. So everyone can learn how to program R and see how I'm doing. Um, have I need R as a language like C? Um, in theory, the languages are equivalent. So if you know how to program in R, you don't really need to know how to program in C. If you know how to program in C, you don't really need to know how to use R. But every language that is out there and still exists has an advantage. Like one of the things which R is really bad at is managing random access memory. Um, but a language like C gives you very strict control over your memory, but not just the memory, but also over the timing. Like there's no garbage collector which can come in and and screw your timing. So if you if you use R, um, then R can do a lot of things for you, like linear models in like a single line of code. In C, you can also do linear models, but that's gonna be like. 20, 30, 40 lines of code because you have to write part of the code yourself or you have to use a dynamic link library developed by someone else. And the nice thing about R is that you have built in uh, linear models. You have built in probability distributions. So the language is, is, is different from C. Um, I will practice by myself and I'm already using R for my PhD, tidy first ggplot. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the idea behind my lectures is is that you don't need all of that. Like I never, like I've been working with R for eight years here, four years PhD, that's 12 years plus two years master is 14 years. I've been programming in R for 14 years and I've never used tidyverse, never ever. If I see people writing code in tidyverse to select a column from a matrix, I'm like face bombing and thinking like, the, my philosophy in programming is, is that you want to have as little dependencies as possible because dependencies create pain and baggage for the future. Because tidyverse might change, tidyverse might disappear altogether. Chances of it are low because it's used by a lot of people but there is no guarantee, right? Someone like Hadley Wiggum is a really, really good programmer. He made ggplot. But if he gets hit by a bus and there's no funding to hire someone behind uh, or after him, then the whole thing ends, right? And then you are stuck with the version that you have and bugs don't get fixed. And so, the idea behind all of these lectures is, is to make you guys familiar in how to use base R, to use R without any dependencies. And that is, that is almost impossible because there are some really, really good packages out there, right? So packages like Biomart. Um, but I try to always minimize my dependencies. So one of the rules when you build an R package is that you cannot have more than four dependencies. So as soon as you type library ggplot, library tidyverse, library something else, right? You, you can only use four and that's the limit. Um, I like ggplot only when I use it to plot real-time sensor data, it always gets me in trouble. I like ggplot as well. I love how it looks. It's just that after programming in R for like 14 years, I am not going to make the investment to learn a whole new syntax. And that's the same for tidyverse, right? Everything that you can do with tidyverse, you can also do with base R. It's just a, um, a layer on top, which m should make it easier for people. But if you know base R, then there is no reason to use tidyverse or Tibble or the other stuff because it doesn't add anything. It's just the same, but using a different syntax. So for someone who already knows R and is already programming in R for 14 years, it's just an additional investment for me, right? I have to spend more time learning a new syntax, figuring out what it does. Like as, as soon as I see this like greater than symbol, percent greater than symbol, I'm like, I'm not gonna read this code because like 
they're generally using it for very, very basic things, which could just be achieved by using an apply function. Um, but that's, that's just the way that I think. I think dependencies should be avoided because it just gets you into trouble in the long run. Because someone like Hadley Wiggum, he's a, he's a perfect guy. The code that he writes looks really good. I love ggplot. I love the stuff that, that he does. But if he gets hit by a bus tomorrow, it all ends. And then you, if you only know how to plot in ggplot, then you will have a problem. Because ggplot will more or less cease to be updated. And in a couple of versions, it will be thrown out of R. Um, so there's always a risk um, when you use when you use dependencies. So I I I I love ggplot. It looks beautiful. I've used it myself in the past a couple of times. But if I am teaching a course to teach people how to program R, in my opinion, ggplot should not be in there because it is a different syntax altogether. What is the bet best route for learning data science? The best route for learning data science is learning at least one programming language, be it Python, be it R, um, be it Perl. Um, those are kind of the three main languages which are used in data science. So learn a programming language. And then find questions that interest you and, um, and, and try to answer those. Right? Try to get a feeling on how you build linear models or how you use things like machine learning to answer questions. Because in the end, data science or bioinformatics is about the extracting knowledge from data. Right? Data is just that. It's just stuff that people measured. And it's not, it's not knowledge in itself. Right? People always say, but we can sequence it. Right? But sequencing a genome does not tell you anything. You need to, do, to figure out how these variants in the genome are controlling things like phenotype. And the same thing holds for data science. No matter if you're looking at political science or if you're looking at economic science, what people do is they gather large amounts of data and someone in data science is there to formulate interesting questions and then to use the data to try and answer those questions. So the best way to learning it is learn one programming language and become really, really good at it. So just spend five hours every weekend programming, writing little programs for things that interest you. Um, I think I gave the example here on stream that I was talking to people and they were mentioning to me like, well, all my friends are having their birthday in more or less a two month period. So am I selecting my friends based on when they were born or which month they were born? And these are very simple questions to answer. You can just go on the street, ask random people like, what is your birthday? What are the birthdays of your two best friends? Right? Completely anonymous. You don't need to know their name. You just want to know their birth date and then the birth date of their two or their three best friends. And then you can start gathering a little bit of data. And then you can start writing a script to analyze that data. If you're interested in weather data and, for example, climate change, then there is so much information out there. You can get like 150 years of temperature measurements and humidity measurements from, from most weather stations. Um, uh, just figure out what your local um, KNME is. KNME is the, the organization in Holland which collects the weather data and, and does all of these things. Um, and there's so much free data available. Like you can use Google Financial to get 25 years of, of stock prices. So if you're interested in modeling stocks and, and doing predictions on if, if a certain stock will go up or if it will go down, all of this data is available for free. If you are interested in cancer and how genes or which genes are involved in cancer, there is literally 40, 50 years of microarray data available at databases like uh, the Gene Expression Omnibus. 
which you can download for free. So just download some data and start writing code. Start understanding what the data structure is, um, what could go wrong, how you can model that, and how you can model, for example, the influence of weather on stock prices. Um, because two data sets completely disjunct from each other. The one is weather data, the other one is, is stock price data. And you can mash them up, right? You can, you can see if the weather has an influence on the stocks of Tesla or if it has an influence on things like Unilever. Right, so there, there's a lot of things that you can that you can do, and the most important thing is learn a programming language, and learn how to use it for yourself to to analyze or to answer your own questions that you might have, because just following a boot camp or just listening to me talking on YouTube is not going to make you a good data scientist. The way that makes you a good data scientist is to to download data and start doing your own analysis which sounds really conspiracy theory right like people in conspiracy theories always tell you like oh do your own research right but the doing your own research is 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 what you should do to become good it's just that you shouldn't do research on facebook right you should you should use valid data sources like um your local police station which publishes crime reports if you're interested in crime or use your local meteorological service if you're interested in weather or climate change um, but find where the raw data is download the raw data and start modeling yourself and sometimes the answers might really surprise you um, and and might be different than what other people think but yeah that's that's the important part do your own research do it based on valid sources and do it based on on how you think things should be modeled like george box always said and i can't repeat this enough like if you do data analysis then you're always doing something which is a statistical model right it's something which is not true you're always working with associations which are not true measurements there it, there's always a high level of uncertainty be aware that there is uncertainty when you make graphs put error bars on the graphs like show what the confidence is um, so that's kind of my advice is just like learn a programming language and start answering questions that you have yourself and it can be really fun and that's also one of these things which makes you a good programmer. A good programmer does fun stuff. We, we didn't talk about how to make little movies or animated GIFs in R. Um, and in the past, I wrote a little Flappy Bird kind of thing for R, where um, you use the R plotting window and you, you overdraw every frame. And if you press enter, then like a dot goes up and you have kind of a flappy bird system um, where you can do fun stuff with it. Doing fun stuff, doing crazy stuff is part of programming. Programming is actually a very, very creative field in my mind. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not like people say a real beta, right? Mathematics is really beta, physics is really beta, but programming is kind of in between the two. And you have programming encompasses everything. Um, it allows you to be creative, to find new ways of doing. Good. So that's a whole rant about uh, one question. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Shufo Dip. I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. Um, so if there's no more questions, then um, thank you guys so much for, for being here for, my, for the last lecture of the current R course. Um, I will definitely be back. Um, I will be streaming on Twitch probably next week since um, I will be on holiday next week and the week after. Um, thanks for the lectures the past two, two and a half years and good luck at your new job. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll stay in contact, Misha. And uh, I'll definitely stream more. Like there's, there's so much interesting stuff to tell you guys. Like I literally have like one and a half gigabytes of code um, because I had to clean up my, my computer here for 
going to my new job. Um, and there's, there's, there's so much crazy stuff that I did in the past. Which resources are best for learning R? So for learning R, I would say that if you follow this course, right? If you look at the, the 11 videos that we, I now made, so the 11 live streams, um, then in total you have around 35, 40 hours of me talking about R and, and live coding the examples. Um, then you have a relatively solid basis. There are a couple of good books out there. Um, like um, what's the one that I always advise? Um, and those are actually available on Moodle as well. Um, so in the Moodle system, there's three books that I put in there. Um, so it is the A Beginner's Guide to R from Zür, 2009. Then there is um, Introductory Statistics with R by Dahlgaard, 2008. And then there's Understanding Statistics Using R um, by Schumacher Tomek, uh, published in 2013. Um, those three books used to be free from Springer because of the pandemic. Um, and those are really, really, um, really good introductory books. So you just go through the book. Most of the books have some assignments in there. Um, I can recommend the data analysis using R lectures by Dr. Ahrens. Yeah, well, I'm, I don't want to promote myself too much, but uh, do you have an indication of other great lectures in learning R as yours? Ooh, that's difficult. Um, I was on a conference last week in Rotterdam and I figured out that one of the, um, one of the guys that I met there um, also gave lectures on YouTube. I don't know actually if he gives our lectures, but I can look that up very quickly because I subscribe to him. Um, see, do they do our courses? Introduction to genomics, Blink in R, R for beginners. Um, yeah, look up genomics bootcamp. Um, and then the uh, R for Beginners lecture. Um, let me copy the link for you guys to put in chat. Um, oh, uh, that's the wrong. Let me see if that link works. No, that's for some reason. What's going wrong with the link then? Let me try this again. All right, so that didn't work too well. Um, but yeah, just search for R for beginners and then the, 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 the channel is called Genomics Bootcamp. I, I don't like the name of the channel. But he's a really good guy, like uh, uh, Gabor. Um, he's a he's a good guy. He really tries hard. Um, and yeah, definitely the introduction by Carl Broman, like the the link that my moderator put in chat, is is really uh, really good. Links okay, okay, yeah. Because when I click the link, um, I I go to a channel error. But that might be because I'm coming from the streaming environment and not on YouTube itself. Uh, so yeah, um, Carl Broman definitely works, um, is, is worth it as well. Um, he's one of the guys that when I was learning R and learning statistics really helped me like a lot in, in figuring out how statistics works. Um, so definitely. And there's definitely like, like just search for R course, right? And on YouTube, it's really hard. You have to like the person in a way, right? The the voice has to be okay. The sound, like they're, they're it really depends. Um, it also depends on your own background. So, um, but yeah, de definitely uh, um, give Gabor a, a shout out uh, because I I met him on the conference last week and I saw his lectures or not so much his lectures. He did a talk about education via YouTube, um, and I totally agree with with what he said. Um, like it 
it, it is very important to involve people directly when you do lectures. Um, but he, he has a slightly different idea um, behind it because he makes these like 20 minute videos um, and he's not like me, right? Like I'm just sitting here talking in my office, um, but he really like writes a script beforehand and says, we want to know this, 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 and this. And then he kind of compacts it all into 20 minutes um, while I'm more from the other side. I'm more like, I want you guys to exactly know what's going on. And I, I'd rather talk for an hour about how to select something from a matrix and make sure that you understand exactly the minutia um, while he just does it slightly uh, slightly different um, but yeah Carl Broman is like perfect as well um, he's, he's especially good when it comes to uh, comes to statistics um, and and genetics so he, he's definitely uh, worth uh, checking out as well all right any more questions like I'm starting to get the feeling that we're just getting warmed up and uh, although the lecture is more or less finished but that we, we um, that there's actually some good questions coming up so um, I like that a lot I like that a lot so but if there's no more questions then uh, I'm just gonna end the last lecture of this R course very very sad I actually might do one next week about like a topic that interests me and is not part of the exam. Um, like I said, I will be free from next week on. Tomorrow is my last day at work here. And then I have like one and a half months uh, before the next job start. And I might make some videos. I might play some video games on Twitch because I have my Twitch channel as well. Um, so. That's good. All right, so then thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for being here and um, make sure to give a like or a subscribe to the channel. It really helps out on YouTube. Like by liking the video, other people will get informed about it and it, the, the reach is just a lot bigger. Good, then uh, with that, um, thank you for being here for the last like two and a half hours. I, I really enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed the course. If you have any feedback, negative feedback, um, also let me know um, because I'm always glad to hear from students and um, get some feedback on things that I might improve in the future. So with that, um, I will see you guys next time. Um, I don't know exactly when, but I will make sure that I post at least early or more in advance than I did today. Today was a little bit silly because I, I did not schedule the stream like a couple of days in advance but i hope people that enjoyed the lectures and the stream are still here and uh i i, I thank you so much for being here and i will see you guys next time so thank you and goodbye <laughs>